Hi, it's Steph here. Welcome back to episode two of my ASP mini series, where I aim to teach clinical pharmacists without prior infectious disease training or background on how to assess a patient's antimicrobial therapy and to use antimicrobial stewardship strategies in their practice. You'll hear me use the terms antimicrobial and antibiotic therapy. Basically, antimicrobial therapy is an all-encompassing term that includes antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitics, whereas antibiotic is, well, just antibiotic. It's uh, specific for agents that kill bacteria. In this episode, I will go over the antimicrobial stewardship strategy of de-escalation. To use the strategy, you will need to know your antimicrobial therapy well, especially the spectrum of bugs that it will kill. If the thought of learning your whole spectrum of antimicrobial therapy is overwhelming to you, I would suggest that you focus on the antibiotics first. And this is because bacterial infection is the most common infections that we encounter in hospital as pharmacists. And for this reason, this episode and its examples will also focus on assessing antibiotic therapy and bacterial infections. So what does de-escalation mean? De-escalation refers to using your culture and sensitivity result and choosing the narrowest antibiotic that will target the specific pathogen and the infection. It can also refer to stopping empiric antibiotic treatment when the workup has ruled out an infection. I will focus on the first one where we're narrowing the antibiotic to a culture result when an infection has been diagnosed because this is the easier strategy to adopt for pharmacists without prior infectious disease or antimicrobial stewardship training. When I refer to broad spectrum antibiotics, I'm referring to those antibiotics that kill a wide range of bugs. For example, piperacillin and tazobactam is one of these agents. It covers many gram positives, including your streptococci and uh, sensitive uh, enterococcus, uh, such as your uh, enterococcus faecalis. It also covers a wide range of gram negatives, uh, such as your um, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Pseudomonas and also has anaerobic coverage. On the other hand, a narrower spectrum agent would cover less bugs. And a, an example of this would be cloxacillin. Uh, so cloxacillin was made mostly to target a methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus. So its spectrum is relatively limited to a susceptible Staphylococcus aureus, such as MSSA, and susceptible coagulase negative staph. Again, I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with your antibiotics first so that you're able to pick out uh, what agents are considered broader versus narrower spectrum when you're looking at a culture result. I would suggest you doing this by reviewing your lecture notes, reading up and learning antibiotics yourself, and practice applying this knowledge to assessing infections in your practice. Later on in this series, I plan to share some resources that I find helpful when learning antibiotics and uh, reviewing their spectrum. But some examples of the resources that I use in my practice daily as a antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist is the Sanford Guide to Antimicrobial Therapy. So here's my Sanford Guide. They have a book as well as a mobile app. They release a revised version of this book every year. In terms of using it to de-escalate antimicrobial therapy, I love this table that they have here that goes over the spectrum of most commonly encountered antibiotics. And so they list out the antibiotics here and the pathogens here um, with these green, yellow, and red colored boxes. And they have the legend there, but basically it just means what, um, what you think it would mean. Green means it would be sensitive, usually to the pathogen. Yellow means it, you might encounter some variable resistance. And red just means it's usually res as resistant to um, that pathogen and not to use it. I typically use the mobile app uh, just because I don't like to carry my book around uh, and I also find that it is easier to find information in the mobile app because there's a search function. Another resource that I really like is the First Line mobile app and I'll show you on my mobile phone here. So it's that one there and it looks like this when you open it. It's location specific. Hospitals need to pay money to be included in the first line platform. So if your hospital didn't choose to opt into this program, um, 
you can still access it, but I would pick the closest location to you because it would reflect the resistant patterns and the dosing, I think, more closely uh, to the hospital that you're working for. And so you can change the location by clicking on the logo here and wait until it loads and pick the location that is closest to where you're working. And so you can see that there is a variety of hospitals across North America, um, a lot in the States and some in Canada as well. Once you set up your location, this is the main screen that you get. And I love this one where you look at the antimicrobials there. And let's say we pick amoxicillin where you want to pick their, um, or look up the spectrum. You can see that there are um, multiple tabs that will show you further information on this antibiotic, but there is a specific tab called general spectrum of activity. And look at this great summary that it gives you. So this is what I love about this app. It's quick, it's concise, and it's easy to use, and you don't have to carry it around a book. Here's another example that I wanna show you. So this is for cefazolin. And if you look at the um, general spectrum of activity, you can see its general coverage as well as the notable exceptions. So you can quickly see here that it, uh, cefazolin will not cover your Haemophilus influenza, your enterococci, and MRSA, just to name a few. So very quick and easy uh, reference. Um, that you can use quickly uh, during a busy clinical day. So anyways, I went on a long tangent on learning antibiotics and the resources to use. So going back to talking about our ASP strategy of de-escalation, you can start implementing the strategy when patients are on around their day three of antibiotic therapy. The reason for this is because we usually will get the bacterial culture and sensitivity results back if any pathogens are growing within three days of uh, initial collection. Therefore, day three would be a good time to review the results and the sensitivity, as well as the spectrum of their uh, antibiotic that they're on to see if we can further narrow or de-escalate their antibiotic to something narrower that would be equally effective at treating the infection that they have. So you might ask, or you might get asked by other team members, uh, why go through the hassle of de-escalating if the patient is tolerating their therapy fine and they're improving? If we're able to de-escalate a patient's antibiotic therapy, it would actually be to their benefit. Multiple observational studies have found that broader spectrum antimicrobial is associated with a higher risk of C. difficile diarrhea. And developing C. diff diarrhea has been associated with significant morbidity as well as mortality in patients. Furthermore, when they develop their first episode of C. difficile diarrhea, they are at higher risk of developing further episodes in the future. I have seen patients with severe C. diff diarrhea admitted to the ICU, hypotensive, relying on pressors, and requiring a large section of their large intestine being removed. So we want to try to avoid the side effects at all costs. By de-escalating, we also reduce the development of resistance to these broad spectrum agents so that we're able to conserve these agents for future use. After de-escalating the patient's therapy, it is also prudent to monitor how they're doing on this new regimen uh, to ensure that they continue to improve. Now I'll present a case and highlight how I assess the patient's antibiotic therapy and utilize this de-escalation strategy. So meet SF. She is a 65-year-old female admitted with pyelonephritis. Prior to admission, she had suprapubic tenderness, fever, bilateral flank pain, dysuria for two days. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension and type 2 diabetes. She is currently on day three of ceftriaxone therapy, and you note that she is improving. She tells you that her dysuria suprapubic tenderness, flank pain that she came in with has resolved. You know that she has also defervesced for the past two days, that her white blood cell count is decreasing, that her blood pressure and heart rate, as well as respiratory rate is stable, and that imaging done on a mission did not show any evidence for a deeper source of infection or source control issue that needs to be addressed before antibiotic stops. 
such as an obstructed renal stone. You also note from her MAR that she is taking all of her oral medications and per her nurse, she's eating all of her meals. You notice that the blood and urine cultures collected on emission before antibiotics started, both grew E. coli, that is considered pan-sensitive. It is sensitive to ampicillin, cefazolin, ceftriaxone, septra, cipro, piperacillin, tazobactam, erdapenem, and miropenem. Pan-sensitive is a medical jargon that just means that it is sensitive to all the tested antibiotic. Once you are familiar with your antibiotics, you'll know that ampicillin and cefazolin are both narrower spectrum than ceftriaxone and are potential alternatives to consider. And for IV antibiotics such as ampicillin and cefazolin, it will also be helpful for you to know their oral equivalent because sensitivity to the IV version will predict its sensitivity to the oral equivalent. So for example, the oral equivalent of ampicillin IV is oral amoxicillin, and whereas uh, for cefazolin IV, the oral equivalent would be cephalexin. Since SF is improving, it would be uh, reasonable to narrow down her ceftriaxone to these narrower options. I'll make a later episode on how you can assess a patient to see whether they're ready for a IV to oral antibiotic step down. In SF's case, you note that she does not have any drug-related allergies. Her kidney function is good with a creatinine clearance of 90 milliliters per minute, and there is no deeper focus of infection or source control issue. Since SF is tolerating her diet and oral medications, I would change her ceftriaxone to amoxicillin given orally three times a day to complete a total of seven day course counting from the start of her ceftriaxone therapy. My rationale for picking amoxicillin over cephalexin is that it is still slightly narrower spectrum and it is a three times daily dose rather than the four times daily dosing with cephalexin. So it just makes for ease of administration as well for both the nurse and for the patient if she does get discharged. Don't give up if the first few assessments takes you a lot of time to review. The more you immerse yourself into assessing patients' antibiotic therapy and the more um, infections that you see, and don't worry, you'll see a lot of urinary tract infections and a lot of pneumonias, the better and faster you will become. Always engage your team members when discussing your suggestions and rationale just to make sure you're not missing anything in your assessment. And don't hesitate to reach out to your local antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist if you need help. We are always happy that pharmacists are stewarding on our behalf, and so we're always willing to answer any questions or to mentor you if needed. I hope you found this episode helpful. Let me know in the comments below if you have any other questions on de-escalation. And make sure to check the description box below as I'll include some links to some of the ID related resources that I use. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video of this mini series. Till next time, bye. Thank you.